Welcome to the SGH Rheumatology Rapid Review Series on Rheumatoid Arthritis. My name is Ng Chin Tae. I am one of the consultants in the Department of Rheumatology and Immunology, Singapore General Hospital. In this lecture, I will take you through epidemiology, pathogenesis, and clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis. We will also learn how to perform initial investigation, assess disease activity, initiate short-term and long-term treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most common autoimmune inflammatory arthritis. It has an estimated annual incidence of 40 per 100,000 people. The prevalence varies in countries, but it is generally accepted that the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis is 0.5% to 1% of the general population. The disease more commonly affects the women, and the peak onset is between 50 and 75 years old. Rheumatoid arthritis uh, leads to disability. It is also associated with poor quality of life, reduction in employment, and reduced productivity. According to the data from Singapore Burden of Disease Study 2010, rheumatoid arthritis is the 12th leading cause of overall burden in Singapore, defined by disability-adjusted life years. It is the seventh leading cause of overall years lost to disability. This simplified schematic presentation demonstrated the interaction between environmental factors and genetics in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. There is loss of tolerance towards decitrinated proteins. When inflammation of the joints or synovitis is initiated and perpetuated, it leads to rheumatoid arthritis. The chronic inflammation also drives other coexisting diseases like cardiovascular disorders, osteoporosis, metabolic syndrome, and certain cancers. Genetic factors are important in rheumatoid arthritis. However, the concordance rate in monozygotic twins was only about 15%, suggesting environmental factors play a critical role too. The strongest link between a gene and rheumatoid arthritis is the association of the disease with an epitope in the third hypervariable region of the HLA-DR beta chains, known as the shared epitope. However, there are now over a hundred different gene polymorphisms associated with rheumatoid arthritis, which include some non-HLA genes as well. Cigarette smoking is a strong risk factor for the development of rheumatoid arthritis, especially individuals with the shared epitope. In addition to increasing disease susceptibility, smoking is also associated with greater disease severity. Periodontal disease is associated with rheumatoid arthritis. The bacteria associated with periodontitis is P. gingivalis, a bacteria that contains the enzyme peptidyl arginine deaminase, which allows the bacteria to generate citrinated peptide in vivo. More recently, studies have shown that gut microbiome is associated with the development of rheumatoid arthritis. At cellular level, the interactions between dendritic cells, T cells and B cells occur mainly in the lymph nodes, resulting in autoimmune response to citrinated proteins. In the synovial membrane, adaptive and innate immune pathways integrate to promote tissue remodeling and damage. Positive feedback loops are mediated by the interactions among the white cells, fibroblasts, chondrocytes and osteoclasts, together with the molecular products of damage. All this drives the chronic inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. The key inflammatory molecules are tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. The increased blood flow in the synovial inflammation leads to redness and heat, and the increased fluid causes joint swelling. Chronic inflammation leads to destruction of the cartilage and loosening of ligaments. Clinically, rheumatoid arthritis can only be diagnosed after a proper history from the patient, performing a physical examination, and ordering some key investigation. During history taking, we shall inquire about the onset of the symptoms, disease duration, the pattern of joint pain and joint involvement, the presence or absence of swelling, early morning stiffness of the joint, and systemic features of chronic inflammation. We should look for features of other conditions that can mimic rheumatoid arthritis, which include hepatitis B and C, psoriatic arthropathy, inflammatory bowel disease, SLE, and other connective tissue disorders. We should also explore family history and smoking history. The classical rheumatoid arthritis usually has a history of insidious onset with symmetrical involvement. The pain and swelling usually affect the small joints, like the metacarpal phalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joints. 
The patient's also complaining of significant early morning stiffness of the joints. On physical examination, the joints are tender and swollen. Sometimes we find extra-articular involvement like carpal tunnel syndrome, interstitial lung disease, and vasculitis. Other than the classical presentation, rheumatoid arthritis can present initially as palindromic rheumatism, monoarthritis, or extra-articular involvement. The initial investigation includes full blood count, renal and liver profile, inflammatory markers like ESR and C-reactive protein, rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibody, hepatitis B and C serology, x-ray of the hands and feet, and the chest x-ray. The x-rays on the right side of the slide show features of established rheumatoid arthritis with joint erosions, joint subluxation, reduced joint space, and pancarpal ankylosis. Using the 2010 ACR and EULA classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis, a definite RA is based upon the presence of synovitis in at least one joint, the absence of an alternative diagnosis that better explains the synovitis, and the achievement of the total score of at least 6 of a possible 10 from the individual scores in four domains, which include features of the joint involvement, serology, acute phase reactants, and the duration of the disease. To assess the disease activity, we ask our patients regarding their pain, swelling, early morning stiffness of the joints, and fatigue. We examine our patients to look for the number of tender and swollen joints, deformities, functional status, and extra-articular involvement. We look at their blood test results, focusing on their full blood count and inflammatory markers. We also look at their x-rays of their joints. These days, there's an increasing use of musculoskeletal ultrasound and MRI in our day-to-day -day practice. There are also validated disease activity scores for rheumatoid arthritis, including the DAS-28 scores, SDI and CDI. Adopting a treat-to-target approach, these disease activity scores help the physician to adjust the medication. The most important management strategy in rheumatoid arthritis is to see the patient early, diagnose them early, and treat them early. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, the management of rheumatoid arthritis is multidisciplinary. While rheumatologist is the key physician in managing the condition, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, podiatrists, nutritionists, and orthopedic surgeons all play an important role. The initial treatment of rheumatoid arthritis is usually symptomatic control. This can be achieved by prescribing glucocorticoid, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or analgesics. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs provide symptomatic relief and improve function, but they have no impact in disease progression. Glucocorticoid, usually used at low doses, is a calming bridging therapy. Long-term monotherapy of glucocorticoid is not recommended because it's associated with many side effects. The medication is usually given orally, but can be also given intravenously, intramuscularly, or intraarticularly. The key drugs for rheumatoid arthritis are the conventional synthetic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, biologics, and the most recent one, small molecules. By using these medications, we aim to help our patients reaching clinical remission or low disease activity. The drug therapy should be adjusted at least every three months in order to reach targeted clinical outcomes. These are some examples of the commonly used conventional synthetic DMARDs, which include methotrexate, sulfasalicin, hydroxychloroquine, and leflunamide. Methotrexate is the most commonly used DMARD in rheumatoid arthritis and the most effective single DMARD. It is given as oral tablet or subcutaneous injection. It is a weekly medication. Metotrexate works by inhibiting the metabolism of folic acid through dehydrofolate reductase. It has good benefit to risk ratio. It can be used as a single therapy or in combination with other medication. The side effects include teratogenicity, cytopenia, transaminitis, alopecia, mouth ulcers, and dyspepsia. If the conventional synthetic DMARDs fail to control the disease activity in rheumatoid arthritis, we can consider using biologics. The biologics can be classified into anti-TNF therapy, interleukin-6 inhibitor, B-cell depletion therapy, and T-cell co-stimulation inhibitor. Most recently, we also can use JAK inhibitor to treat rheumatoid arthritis. The more advanced a biologic therapy 
have better efficacy than the traditional medication. Their use is, however, limited by the cost and the increased risk of infection. To read more about rheumatoid arthritis, I recommend that you read these articles. They are written by the experts of the field. In conclusion, rheumatoid arthritis is a complex autoimmune disease. We should treat rheumatoid arthritis early to avoid disability. The management is multidisciplinary. The drug treatment can be broadly divided into symptomatic control and more long-term treatment using disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs.